Press record. Excellent. Hi, I'm Jeremy Warlock, and I'm talking to you from the Upper Peninsula, Michigan. So it's pretty snowy and cold here. I'll address that later in my talk. I hope everybody can hear me all right. I'm, uh, I've got a little bit of music playing, which is kind of the way I start out my meditation groups now. to open with a quote. This is the human condition and I'm trying to make peace with it. So this is a quote by Matthew Brensilver, a meditation teacher from California. Uh, he's like the master of quotes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and get the music uh, off the screen now. Turn it completely off. So, thank you for bearing with me here. And I right into this. Oh boy. Okay. So thank you for having me here today. Bonus points for anybody who can identify the photographer here. One flash of a moment of time captured by the, uh, the genius artist who, who took this photo. My guess is that he didn't even know there was a, a cyclist uh, about to come through the frame. So here's a quote from Stephen Batchelor. I'm going to talk about him a lot today. The Buddha's teachings are confrontative. They're about truth telling, not about painting some pretty picture of life elsewhere. They're saying, look, existence is painful. This is what is distinctive about the Buddhist attitude. It starts not from the promise of salvation, but from valuing that sense of existential anguish, we tend to ignore, deny, or avoid through distractions. That's kind of the key word here, right? Distractions. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is everywhere these days. Um, it's actually even been co-opted. It's, it's, it, I, I was thinking earlier, it's almost like it's gotten worse. I don't know if it's surpassed the, uh, the Bob Marley energy drink branding thing yet, but maybe it has. Um, but it's everywhere. It's trendy. There's even a backlash now. Um, so that means it's, it's gotten really big. So uh, kind of like when a, a cool underground band gets too big and then the early fans don't think it's cool anymore to like them. Um, you get a little bit of that, but so a definition of mindfulness, I'll just give my quick generic definition. Besides just present moment awareness, right? Present time, non-judgmental awareness. I like to add in the non-judgmental because that's the first thing we notice what happens when you sit and you just, Try to notice what's happening right now without, without reacting to anything. You notice the reactions, you notice the resistance. For me, it's about six to eight seconds I start to notice my mind trying to wander, that monkey mind. So noticing the, the wandering and being okay with that. But I like to add another word in, a very important word, especially when we're talking about uh, you know, libraries, what, what the kind of work that we do, um, kind awareness. So this element of, of compassion and what we're doing with this, when, you're, when you sit and you take a moment to, to practice meditation, you're really, you're really uh, taking care of yourself, but you may notice uncomfortable thoughts, uncomfortable feelings, pain. Try meditating for 40 minutes straight, uh, like, if you go to a, a Zando, the, the Zazen, you know, they, they make you sit a specific way, half lotus, 
you know, your leg inevitably after 15 minutes, one leg is going to fall asleep. Uh, the panic sets in, the pain. So it's developing this kindness, being okay with whatever arises when we try to still our minds. So Christina Feldman, an author I greatly admire, she puts it this way, the ability to turn towards your present moment experience and see it without the usual distortions, attitudes, and interpretations that people usually bring to their life. So turning toward as opposed to turning away from. This is what we typically do in life is we, we don't want to deal with what's uncomfortable. You try to sit and meditate for three seconds. You notice that it's, it's not fun. It's too noisy. A lot of times in my group, we were, we're across the hall from, from the Democratic Party meeting. They get really lively. And when they leave the room, they're all talking loud, but that usually coincides with the time that we're trying to be silent. So we work with that. We work with the distractions. We work with uh, the fact that we want to push these things away that are unpleasant, uh, that are difficult. Another quote, being lost in a thought versus knowing what we're thinking. So that's typically what happens. We, we don't realize that we're being pulled, kind of being pulled by whatever our mind are, is doing, whatever our emotions are telling us to do, we're pulled by it. This is taking a moment, zooming out, kind of becoming, training part of our mind to be like a security camera to observe ourselves, right? So we're, we're becoming aware of what's going on not just in the mind, not just what we're thinking, but we have a tendency to start with the breath. That's how the Buddha taught us, taught his followers how to meditate. And that's the actual practice that he did throughout his life, um, was just this basic coming back to the breath again and again. Whenever a thought, I'm not really here to train you in how to, how to sit and meditate, but I'm just gonna touch upon this a little bit. We, you know, most meditation that's done is uh, mindfulness of breath. The most basic, the most basic thing. It's an autonomic fun function of the body. Uh, our body breathes itself, but we want to start. We want to take over. We want to control it. We that res resisting that urge is what we're doing. To to control, to uh, to be in charge, to let our let our breath breathe itself. So we're we're seeing a thought as a thought, a sound as a sound. Whoops. It's usually the first step toward not being identified with those experience, being identified. We're being pulled by whatever our, our, experience, our experience is. Whether it's strong emotion or uh, a, recurring, a recurring thought, a, a rumination. We typically don't, we're not aware that we're doing it. We're just obsessing. We're just uh, resisting or, or whatnot. So it protects the mind from the surges of impulse the surges of reactivity. That's a key word for me is reactivity. We're noticing uh, the habit that we have to, to react against what's unpleasant for us. Briefly, what mindfulness is not. So what we're not trying to do is empty our mind. We're actually trying to be with what's happening be the observer. It doesn't necessarily involve sitting absolutely still. Uh, you can practice mindful walking. You can practice mindful dishwashing, mindful um, eating. I've done that in, uh, in retreat settings where you, there's no talking at, at mealtimes. It's pay attention to every flavor, every bite of that food. You know, I, I actually came up with a technique here uh, only in the summer. That's the only time I can do it. Uh, it doesn't really work too well in the snow, but is uh, mindful cycling, mindful bike riding, slow mindful bike riding. So just going as slow as you can uh, until you feel like you're about to fall over and doing a, applying a little bit of energy in the form of a, a one pedal, one revolution of the pedal. Um, so applying a little energy to keep you going forward and just being aware. So uh, this is a key thing here, religion. This is, uh, mindfulness is, mindfulness itself isn't a religion. It does stem from Buddhism, but I'm going to get into why I don't think, um, 
it's uh, necessarily a, re a religion, although some people practice Buddhist, Buddhism as a religion, but I've, I've found that um, that doesn't. Um, even the New Age, the metaphysical stuff, woo, um, et cetera, uh, we're not fixing something wrong with ourselves. Uh, that's, a, that's a key thing. You know, sometimes you, you meditate for, for five, 10 years and it's like, well, I, st I still suffer. You know, I still, I still get depressed or whatever. I still have horrible anxiety. It must not work. Um, so we're, we're not trying to, we're not striving for perfection. This one seems a little weird, maybe. Uh, positive thinking, it's, it's not positive thinking. We're not trying to train ourselves to just think in the positive. We're trying to train ourselves to notice whatever those thoughts are, whether they're negative or positive, and try to stop the, the negative feedback loop, the loop, the, I noticed that I'm experiencing anger still from this road rage thing earlier. Um, and, and it just, what I could have gotten back at that person doing by doing this or saying that, or um, ruminating, you know, revisiting it over and over again. Um, this is, is being okay with the fact that I know that something unpleasant is occurring in my mind. Uh, another thing, spiritual bypassing, we have to watch out for this this problem, um, am I trying to meditate to escape from life, to escape from my problems, to, to not have to deal with worry and, and uh, difficulties? There's a key word, boredom. Boredom is a stepping stone to realizing that life is enough as it is. You have to be able to be bored. It kind of reminds me of being a teenager and uh, having to take a long car trip with my parents or whatever. Ah, oh, the worst thing is boredom, is, is being bored. Oh, it's going to be so boring. Um, sitting with that. So this, this, I try to memorize this right here. I try to teach people to memorize this thought. Right now, it's like this. It's like this. I've seen people with this tattooed on their, uh, on their arm, on their forearm. Um, it's not the way I wish it were, it's not the way it was supposed to be, the way it was meant to go, but it's like this, like this, like it is right now, like I'm experiencing it right now. Of course, what comes up when you meditate, um, these are five things that the Buddha taught, but I think anybody could understand craving for, for things to be different, craving for, you might, like right now, I've got to reach for the, the tea. Craving, you know, wanting, wanting something. Um, you'll notice that. You'll notice uh, aversion. You mo uh, noticing maybe the chair isn't very comfortable that you're sitting in or the room is too cold or th there's too much noise in the hallway or something. Um, yeah, try, try, try finding a quiet place to sit. I've been meditating in libraries now for about six years and um, you have to learn to live with, with noise just do. Um, <laughs> restlessness is going to arise at some point uh, of mind or body. You know, you just don't want to sit still. Your, your body just wants to get out, get out there and, and, and get some exercise or something and move around. And it's just, your mind does not want to stay put. The opposite, fatigue. How many times I've woken up to the bell? Uh, you know, just you're tired. The, the fifth one, doubt. This is this feeling of, uh, I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm just not good at this. I'm, I'm just, I know so many people who've, who've tried meditation and have given up right away. Uh, I'm just no good at this. You know, I, my mind just doesn't want to sit still. You know, I fall asleep every time. It's useless. I'm a failure. So uh, this image here from the guardian, uh, I just, it, it cracked me up when I saw it. Uh, you know, I'm imagining the, the laugh track in old uh, TV comedies, um, because I'm not hearing you know, an audience, but uh, this one always makes me laugh when I see it. it uh, I have a printout of this next to my, next to my desk. Um, this it almost seems like this is the promise. This is, this is what you're, you're supposed to have happen when you, when you meditate. You start levitating, everything's happy, blissful. Uh, smiley face emojis are you know, emanating from your, from your being. So, um, 
that that just brings me to another thing. It says, you know, mindfulness is not, you know, there's you talk about the backlash, but th there's also the the worry that, you know, people with PTSD, perhaps meditating and focusing on the body, on the breath, et cetera, is, uh, it could lead to, to a, a problem. So we have to be aware of these things these days. Uh, mindfulness of breath is not always the best thing. Um, perhaps, like I was saying, with the walking or the bike riding or, or paying attention to sounds. You can, you can just notice sounds. Like I, I, I'm very aware of my refrigerator in my apartment, uh, the different cycles that it goes through, the different noises, different sounds. So uh, using that in meditation. For me, at the bottom here, um, the, the term hack, like you, you hacking the teachings, you know, you, you just have to, you have to get good at, at finding what works for you. And, and I, that's what I tell people in my group is, uh, you know, I present them with some different authors, different books, but at some point you will find someone who, who speaks to your experience. Um, and then you never know what you're going to need from, from minute to minute, um, day to day, um, according to the conditions in your life, right? But the Buddha taught is not complicated. Sometimes it's elevated to, to being this complicated thing, but it actually is pretty, pretty awesome that it's something that you can do right now. So uh, we talk about this. I'm going to briefly go into this concept of secular Buddhism. It's just my area of interest. It's just what I do. So that's sort of how I lead my group. Um, even the Dalai Lama has written about uh, secular ethics, you know, getting beyond religion. Um, this author, Stephen Batchelor, he coined the terms secular Buddhism. Um, kind of, you know, secular, obviously, meaning non-religious avoiding the supernatural, the, the, the metaphysical and so forth. But, but seculum, it's, it's Latin, it means our times. Buddhism for our times. It, he actually at one point called it Buddhism 2.0. It's like a new operating system uh, that works for the conditions now for us. Very much like uh, if you look at Buddhism throughout the years, uh, over the centuries, 26 centuries, um, 25 centuries, uh, of how it's evolved and gone from one culture to a different, like gone from India to, to China. And it kind of, after a few centuries, it became uh, Chan, Zen, you know, that uh, stripped away a lot of the, the things and, and went straight to a, a pure experience, a Zen practice. Uh, this is the, the way I see it. This is, a, this is Buddhism for modernity. This is what works great. And it, why does it work for the public library? Because this follows the, the code of, of, of conduct for the library. Um, you know, we're not gonna, libraries, we can't, you know, support a religion versus another, but, but this is, uh, my argument is maybe think of the word Buddhism differently. Um, I could show you a few things about why uh, the Buddha was really kind of opposed to this metaphysics and, and everything. And a lot of that was maybe added on later, uh, rituals and so forth. So. Uh, uh, this quote is, it is possible to recover from the Buddhist teachings a vision of human flourishing that is secular rather than religious without compromising the integrity of the tradition? The question, is there an ethical framework that can underpin and contextualize these practices in a rapidly changing world? So I, I just, I'm very inspired by being able to sort of politely set aside these ideas of of rebirth, you know, um, the the consolation for being, leading a good life, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Um, which, if you really analyze it, this this is India in the fifth century BC. This is the the worldview, the cosmology, and we that's not the worldview of our time. Um, we can we can let go of some of these things and still have these core teachings. I'll I'll skip ahead to. Uh, this really important thing, the causes and the conditions. For the Buddha, everything is what, what, what are the conditions in my life right now? Uh, maybe the conditions in my heart, mind are I'm suffering, I'm stressing out, I'm, I have extreme amounts of anxiety. I need to apply some self-compassion. You know, that, the conditions are extremely important. So we, we talk about these, uh, the Four Noble Truths, uh, the, the beginnings of the Buddha's uh, teachings starts with suffering. Um, the truth of suffering, the arising of, of greed and hatred being the cause of, of this ailment. Um, well, what's the cure? The cure is to not crave anymore. 
Um, but the, how do you get to that? Through an ethical life, this path, this uh, cultivation? Well, I like this rereading of this as action, something we have to do. So a way of life, um, we're getting away from this ontology, the nature of reality, trying to, what is meditating to try to uncover what really is the nature of reality underlying everything. That's not, the, the Buddha, everything is about, everything is constantly changing for us right before our eyes, in our bodies, in our minds, in our world, constantly changing. So this, uh, there's a different way to view this. I will uh, go forward to this as a set of tasks. And this is what I, I like to explain to the people in my group. Um, the first one being rather than life equals suffering, you, you'll see that in library books everywhere, reference section on religion. The Buddha taught that everything about life is suffering. No, that's not what, what it is. What I like to see it as, he's saying you need to notice the things in your life that are difficult and turn toward them, not away. And to embrace them with compassion, learn to, to care, learn to, uh, to, to, to put your arms around yourself and, and to about others when, when they're suffering. Letting go, the second one, to let go of, of reactive emotions, uh, hatred, anger, anxiety, uh, unworthiness, a, a big one, you know, um, ego and all this stuff, craving, nothing's good enough, nothing, you know, it's, we get bored, you know, we get irritable, letting go of that, if you can, for a moment, if you, if you notice it, the only way to notice that is through mindful awareness of what's going on right now. And then um, if, we, if we notice for, just for a moment that we're able to let go of, of a moment of reactivity, of, uh, of anxiety, let's say you're, you just notice that you're, you're anxious, maybe you'll notice that there's a physical element to that, uh, a knot in the, in, the, in the abdominal area or something. And what if you're able to um, say, I'm not gonna feed into it, I'm going to just sort of let go of it, let it be maybe at first. And uh, if you have a moment where you are able to let go of that, or maybe you're angry and you feel like you wanna uh, yell uh, something uh, offensive to somebody who did something, um, some harm to you, um, and you're like, you know, I'm not going to this time. I've, I've been seeing this pattern throughout my life. And that's a moment where you notice the cessation of reactivity, which opens up a path that is this way of life of ethics and wisdom and mind training. So um, I just continuing this briefly, and we'll get to some questions, uh, this uh, idea of uh, what's unique to the, to the Dharma, is this uh, noticing things as, as conditions and causes, nothing's permanent. Uh, having this, what I just mentioned, this, these tasks, this noticing reactivity and so forth, and letting go of it. And um, the perspective of mindfulness, which absolutely comes from the Buddha, from Gautama in the fifth century BC, uh, it came, came from him. And uh, the, the fourth one, which is absolutely important, is autonomy, self-reliance. Just Google uh, Buddhist scandal, sexual misconduct scandal, Buddhism. You know, you will have all kinds of hits. And uh, what I'm trying to tell people is you need to be autonomous in your teach, in your, in your practice. You need to uh, learn to, to be independent. So I won't go into too much detail there. Okay, um, why is it so important that I do uh, secular Buddhism rather than just a mindfulness uh, program. And simply it's just because that's my area of interest. And what I've done is uh, this, I started a group because I felt um, I wanted to connect with others and I wanted to practice with other people. And I, I was told that I would, um, it would uh, increase my understanding of all this to try to explain it to other people and try to discuss it. So I did, and um, after a little while, the director at my library asked me if, uh, if she could sponsor my program. So that would, means I would get a, a room reserved uh, four times a month and um, audio visual equipment and the maintenance staff would set up the chairs for me and, and it's just wonderful. So um, yeah, and then, you know, does anybody have any questions?
because I could sit here and, and, and talk about this literally all day. I'm, I'm very excited about the subject. But uh, thank you, Jeremy. Did you want me to um, unmute folks' mics to allow questions, or do you, do you prefer people to type in the chat window? Um, unmute mics is great. Okay. Hey. <laughs> I, I have questions. <laughs> if people have questions they'd like to ask, you can unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon or the mute button. Well, Jeremy, hi, this is Michael. Michael Stevens, hi there. <laughs> I just, uh, I thank you in the chat, but I, I want to say a couple words. And I, uh, you mentioned uh, walking, like you can meditate when you walk. And I, that's my thing is I walk like crazy and I didn't realize maybe on those times when I'm not plugged into a podcast, when it's just like me in the woods and I talked about forest bathing and the the first session today. That's that's kind of what I'm doing, right? Oh, he's muted. One second. There you go. Oh, you, you that's absolutely what you're doing. You are practicing mindful walking. That okay. just paying attention to your surroundings and you know, maybe maybe not uh, favoring one tree over another, you know. Um, right? Cool. And, <laughs> okay, I think I will do more of that then. I think it's good for me. So thank you so much for this session. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for, for asking me. Yeah. Cool. And I think there's a, somebody had a question in the chat too. So. Oh, oh, was there a question? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, do I see a question here? How much practice do you teach in your sessions? Um, 20 minutes is what we do. And I do a guided meditation. So um, I, I have a slide up here actually of uh, uh, Cersei Dynix. Um, there was a, a woman that was, uh, was a webinar that she's got a, a very small community library in uh, rural Wisconsin. And she, hers is a, a one hour thing. I think they do 40 minutes of meditation once a week and they use Thich Nhat Hanh uh, talks. And what I do is I guide the meditations. Mostly sometimes I'll play talks from the insight timer and yeah. So uh, is it better to have background music? Um, I, I, when I started out meditating, I was literally, that's what brought me to meditation was that musician who I played at the beginning, uh, Indian violinist, uh, El Subramaniam, uh, I could spell it for you, but uh, that, I used to meditate to that, but after a while I let go of that and just uh, use silence and sometimes do the sound meditation, noticing a noise, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, noting that. Yeah, but absolutely meditating to music works well. Um, uh, so the reaction in my library, it's actually I get uh, somewhere between 12 and 18 people um, per, per week. And I, if, if everyone who came regularly or semi-regularly, I'd probably have about 40 or 50 people there. Um, it's been it's been a, a great thing, and actually, since I started my group, uh, other groups have started in town. So, uh, if if you know, don't think that you cannot have an influence on on your uh, community, and the library being a perfect place because uh, sometimes uh, these Buddhist retreats and so forth are extremely expensive. It's really set up for professionals, especially in the in the uh, psychiatric profession. Um, so. What we avoid um, class fees, you know, things like that. It's open to anyone and there's no profit motive. So we, that kind of eliminates the, the spiritual narcissists, the gurus, the people that are in it for the power and control, um, the, uh, the, the, the profit mo motive is, is out of it. Um, yeah. 
Okay. So, oh, that's wonderful. 10 minute guided meditation every Friday. Yeah. I think 10 minutes is a good place to start. And are we still going? Yeah, yes, I can, I can give slides. Also, you've got the library's code of ethical conduct that you have to follow. So that's an important thing. Not like I'm just some guy starting meditation anywhere, you know, and I, this is, anyway, audio visual equipment I mentioned, um, and I've got all the library materials to, to, uh, to promote or to just steer people toward. And Map showing where I'm located. Uh, Peninsula, Michigan. And um, yeah, I was going to show you oh, all the, you know, what else is there to do in the winter here except for uh, winter sports, bike riding, and so forth. Anyway, um, yeah, my group, we, we meet for an hour and a half. The way I break that down is I usually start off with a mindfulness of breath, maybe a body scan a little bit, and then um, switch segue into a heart practice. So loving kindness, compassion, uh, really cultivating that, which is uh, extremely important. Yeah. And then there's a link here to that Circe Dynix uh, webinar that I mentioned, which was excellent. And I can And here, oops, I wanted to say anyone, the most anxious people can, uh, can get benefit from this stuff and can transform their lives. Um, that's the lesson here. <laughs> and then I will put, there's some book recommendations and there's, there's my contact information. And I don't know why I cut my information off a little bit, but I'll go to this final slide here. And there it is. <laughs> yep, and uh, yeah, even uh, the most uh, anxious out there can, um, can benefit from meditation, yeah. Yeah, you guys can get the slides. I can, I can uh, send them to you through email. And okay, are we still going, Vicki? Yes, so whenever you are ready, um, just for the participants who are requesting the slides, I do yeah. recommend that you take down Jeremy's email address. I did put it in the chat window. So Jeremy, do you prefer people email you for a request for a copy of your slide deck? That would People be are, wonderful. Okay, yes. yes. So folks that are entering your email addresses in the chat window, go ahead and copy Jeremy's email address on the current slide. And please send your requests to Jeremy, who is kindly offered to share his slides with those who are interested. Thank and thank, thank you all for attending. And Jeremy, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I learned a lot and enjoyed it very much. I, I see a really good question there, but it's probably too late to answer it. Oh, you can go ahead. Um, the question is from Shannon. It says, can you give an example of using meditation for a stressful interaction with a patron? Uh, that's interesting because I worked at the reference desk um, for three and a half years uh, and definitely have had uh, interactions with unhappy, unkind, uh, difficult patrons, or just people who are um, starting to have memory problems and, and being extremely repetitious, uh, asking for demanding your time every day uh, over the course of each one of those um, years and, and uh, having to uh, be very stressful and annoying. But mindfulness is absolutely essential for, for that, for me, for, that's what got me through those years. Uh, I'm quite an introvert and uh, working there, but applying mindfulness every day in these situations uh, completely transformed me. Um, I'm able to give um, talks to people 
Um, that's one example. Whereas uh, before I would get uh, terrified of public speaking, but yeah, dealing with uh, these patrons who are difficult or, or uh, just demanding of your time or annoying or anything, uh, you first and foremost is training yourselves through mindfulness in a regular practice, five minutes, 10 minutes a day, 20, whatever it is. And um, that trains you to start thinking in this way, to start noticing what's going on in your mind, in your, in your emotions, your reactions and so forth. So you are gonna start noticing the physical symptoms of the reactions. Uh, maybe a knot in the, in the belly or uh, sweating or a throat, dry throat or uh, like a body temperature increase or something like that, uh, heart rate, um, you know, just, just, or maybe a desire to, to, uh, to react uh, verbally and, and it's, First of all, coming back to the breath, note, reminding yourself, okay, let's just take a quick moment to breathe here, to center ourselves and, uh, and notice what's going on. Notice the reaction. Noticing the resistance really is what you're doing. And um, that's, that's, it's, it's really not about the other person. It's about noticing what your reactions are and, um, and being okay with the fact that maybe something they said or did is uh, making you feel extremely unpleasant, and being okay with not feeling un with not feeling pleasant right now. So, I could go on and on for hours about this, but there's not really any time. So, thank you so much, Jeremy. I will go ahead and turn off the recording here if you'd like me okay. to do that for you, or actually, you might need to do that. Let's see here. Okay. I can do the turning off of the recording. Yep. Go ahead and click the stop recording. And stop recording. And thank you very much.